Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Good afternoon, everyone. It's Susan Kaufman. I'm with Attitude Magazine. Um, this is our weekly Attitude um, Attention Deficit Disorder Awareness webinar. Today, we're very fortunate to have with us Dr. Russell Barkley. He is a clinical professor of psychiatry and pediatrics at the Medical University of South Carolina. He's published uh, numerous books um, and manuals um, on attention deficit disorder. Two of the ones that you might want to look up are Taking Charge of ADHD and Your Defiant Child, both published by Guilford Press in New York. Um, Dr. Barkley will be discussing ADHD today in terms of behavior, your children's behavior. His discussions, as all of our um, Attitude webinars, will be um, not specific medical advice to those of you who are asking questions, but will be general um, for general educational purposes. And um, with that, he will give a few minutes of introduction, and then we'll pose as many questions as we have time for um, in the hour that we have that will probably be on the order of 20 questions, so I'll do my best to combine some of your questions which are similar with one another. So with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Barkley, and thank you again for taking part today. Well, welcome everybody, and I'm glad to have you on the uh, webcast this afternoon about the management of ADHD children. I want to just start out with a couple of general remarks about the nature of the disorder, because I think that's the most important starting point for any parent that wants to understand how to manage a child, and that is you have to know what it is that you're trying to manage other than just unruly or disruptive behavior. Uh, many parents have come to understand that ADHD is more than just an attention disorder. In fact, the attention problems and the hyperactivity, as annoying as they can be, are just very superficial surface features of what is a underlying more serious disorder in the child's development of self-control or self-regulation. And so ADHD really is a, a disorder of our ability to manage our own behavior, particularly with regard to later consequences, that is, for our longer-term welfare. It's also important that parents understand that ADHD and this disorder of self-regulation largely arises out of neurological problems, which has been well established in the research literature. Some of these neurological problems uh, are the result of pregnancy complications, birth complications, exposure to trauma or disease or toxins or other difficulties uh, that might interfere with the brain's development. But in most cases, probably up to three-quarters of all ADHD cases in that instance, they are due to genetic causes. That is that children and adults with ADHD inherit certain genes that result in the brain not developing the way it would in a typically developing individual. And that leaves them with these difficulties with self-control. So it's important to understand what these difficulties are in the brain, uh, and they are largely in the part of the brain that is uh, an area called the executive brain. And it's called the executive brain because it allows you con to control yourself, and that is to control the other parts of the brain as well. So ADHD is really EFDD, Executive Function Deficit Disorder, or if you prefer, Self-Control Disorder. Now, these executive abilities are important for parents to understand. that There are seven of them, and it's these that are giving rise to the child's difficulties. The first of these is the ability to monitor your own behavior, to pay, play a spectator on yourself, to be aware of yourself, uh, and to be tracking what it is that you're doing as you go about your routine automatic activities throughout the day. The second one closely linked to that is the ability to stop yourself. and uh, That is, if you are engaging in something that clearly is likely to prove hazardous or harmful to you or lead to some disadvantage, then the individual who is monitoring themselves is able to inhibit their activity. So ADHD is a problem with self-monitoring and self-awareness, and it's also a problem with impulsiveness or inhibition. But then there are two other executive abilities that are very important for parents to understand. The first of these is known as working memory. And working memory can be split into two things. Working memory is holding in mind what you're doing, both the goal that you hope to attain 
and the means that you intended to use to get there. So it's remembering so as to do things. It's not memory. It's not remembering facts and details and learning. It's remembering what you're doing. What was the plan? What was the goal? What were the steps to get to that goal? And we know that working memory, as I've said, comes in two forms. There's the verbal type, which is us talking to ourselves and our mind's voice as we go about our day and writing notes to ourselves and reciting rules to ourselves. We talk to ourselves a lot in our mind, and that's one type of working memory. The other type is largely imagery. We use visual images of our past to guide us, very much like a GPS in a car that you're using to guide you through the terrain that you're driving through. So we use images and words that we hold in mind to guide us over time to our goals. And then the last executive abilities are the ability to control your emotions so that they're consistent with your goals. And of course, ADHD children have trouble with all of these, the working memory and the emotion regulation. And then finally, there is planning and problem solving which is the creative part of our executive ability. Can you come up with possible ways of overcoming obstacles that you may be encountering in daily life? Uh, and so it's kind of the inventiveness or innovation in the executive functions. So these are the multiple mental abilities that ADHD is interfering with in a child's development. And then all of them work together like a symphony in order to help control our behavior over time in order to improve our long-term welfare. So I think it's very important that parents understand ADHD is a complex disorder. It's not just an attention disorder. That these complex executive abilities are all impaired to varying degrees in these children. Children do vary from each other in how severe these problems are, but we know that ADHD interferes with the majority of these executive abilities. And parents need to know that this is largely a neurobiological and genetic disorder. So it's not the result of how you're managing a child. It's not the result of what they're eating necessarily. Certainly isn't the result of watching too much television uh, and so on. It's very much a neurobiological condition. And that means that parents have to approach raising an ADHD child as you would approach working with anyone with a disability. And the first thing that should convey to you is compassion, that you're dealing with someone who, due to no fault of their own, is not able to manage their behavior as well as other children are able to do. So shouting at them, telling them to wake up and smell the coffee and get with the plan or program, uh, just disciplining them, you're not going to train the ADHD out of them. It's part of who they are, and it's a largely permanent part of their behavior and personality. That's not to say that a few children don't outgrow their ADHD, my own research suggests that it's probably anywhere from 15 to 20 percent may fully outgrow the condition and have no further impairment. But even that can take anywhere from 15 to 25 years to take place. So it's largely a chronic condition. So we approach it as a disability. We approach it with compassion. We understand the person we're dealing with cannot help necessarily being the way they are. But we also understand that, as with any disability, we can make it easier for them to succeed and we can reduce the problems they're having so that they can be more effective in what they're trying to do and we can have a lot fewer conflicts with them in trying to help them do so. Uh, I also want parents to understand that these executive abilities give our children their sense of time and their ability to manage themselves relative to time. And so ADHD is the worst disorder you can have and deal with time and time management. And a large part of what parents have problems with is around this issue of timing of a child's behavior, getting ready for things, being prepared for deadlines, looking ahead and planning out what needs to be done, being at certain places at certain times where you've promised to do things for other people. All of these are in jeopardy because of an individual's ADHD. And then I want parents finally to understand that dealing with ADHD requires putting together a package of interventions. And there are five things that go into this package. First, an appropriate thorough professional evaluation and diagnosis. Let's understand the nature of this child's difficulties because every child is different and they all have a different pattern of impairments. 
So we need to make sure we understand those difficulties thoroughly. The second thing is to make sure that you as a parent are well educated, become an expert on ADHD, read widely, and remember that truth is an assembled thing. So don't just read one website or one particular book. Read widely. Start with the chad.org website or start with my website or others out there that are charitable organizations that put out science-based information about ADHD. So educate yourself. The third is to consider whether or not your child may require medication. Children with moderate or more severe ADHD are highly likely to require medication as part of the total treatment package. Children with mild ADHD may not necessarily need that. So be, uh, understand that ADHD, like diabetes, sometimes has to be dealt with by using medication in addition to the other things we're going to do. The fourth thing to keep in mind is behavior modification. How can you change your behavior as a parent in order to change your child's behavior to become better and more successful? And then lastly, the fifth component of the package is accommodations. Just as we make ramps into buildings for people who are physically disabled, we make an accommodation for them in the environment. So ADHD children may require certain changes to the physical environment to help them succeed. For instance, they may need to sit in the front row of their classroom so that a teacher can monitor them more often. We may need to break down their assignments at school or at home or the chores that they have to do into much smaller units and do a small amount of work with a frequent break and then small amount of work again. These are the kinds of accommodations that we're talking about in dealing with somebody who has a disability. So we're certainly not going to be willing to undertake those kinds of accommodations or modify our behavior if we don't understand that ADHD is a chronic disability and that as a parent we are serving in the role of a shepherd to our disabled children but we're not going to train them out of their ADHD, but we can certainly make life for them and for us a lot easier, more pleasant, and more effective. So with those ideas in mind, Susan, let's go ahead okay. and start to take questions. That's very from helpful. Assistants. Um, there are a number of questions here from parents who seem you know, very sophisticated about their, that their child has attention deficit disorder, that they need to help them modify their behavior. The essence of the questions are is, at what point are they, have they gone too far? Are they enabling their child's, you know, lack of uh, responsibility? Or and at what point should they stop or should they expect their child to internalize whatever behavior it is they're trying to modify? Some of the examples in the questions are a parent who sits for two years every night with their child while he or she does homework. Or yeah. another one who is having a very difficult time getting their child to brush his or her teeth every night or take certain actions and they feel that you know for years they've had to be vigilant and they're not seeing any progress in terms of the child taking responsibility and they're wondering if there's something they should be doing differently at what point you know should they see some some positive change <laughs> it's, a, it's a very important question and that is um, when to assist and provide this external structure, this scaffolding, these guardrails and all of these accommodations, and when to start pulling back so that the child can begin to assume more of that responsibility. But we need to understand that by assuming responsibility for our behavior, it means that we have normal executive abilities, and they don't. So they're not going to be able to assume that responsibility at the same age that other children are able to do. Uh, but at some point, they should be able to take more responsibility than they have in prior years. And the best way I help parents to understand this is what I call the 30% rule. On average, if you want to know where your child is functioning and their self-control and these executive abilities, take 30% off their age. That's where your child is. And they're not going to be beyond that at this particular time. So you need to change the environment around them to fit with their executive age. So if you have a 10-year-old, they have the self-control and the time management of a 7-year-old. You cannot be expecting them to do what other people are able to do at 10 years of age. That's not going to happen. So that requires that we lower our expectations, change the environment to suit a younger child, 
and then they should be able to succeed as a younger child would. But it's not going to be demanding that they act their age, live up to age-appropriate expectations, behave like the other children are able to do, and work like the other children. If that's what you're expecting, then you're the problem, not the child. So part of dealing with an ADHD child is understanding the executive age. A 10-year-old is more like a 7-year-old, a 12 more like an 8-year-old, a 16 more like a 12-year-old, uh, and an 18-year-old more like somebody who's about 12 to 14. And then you begin to understand why they're not assuming the age-appropriate responsibilities that other people are, because they're not there yet. They will get there, but they'll get there at a later age, at a later time. And in the meantime, you have to step in and provide that external support, structure, monitoring, supervision of the individual that they're just not going to be able to provide for themselves. And parents have a good sense of that. There are going to be times where you're going to start to pull back and you're going to see that your child just can't manage it on their own, and then you're going to have to increase the amount of support and structure you provide to them. Other times you can start to fade out a little bit of what you're doing, maybe not work with them quite as often on their homework or at least as intensely check in on them periodically to see how they're doing so that they're still accountable to you. But as you start to pull back, you're going to find that they can succeed in those intervals where you're not always over their shoulder or doing the homework with them or monitoring them so closely. But, you know, parents, and each child's going to be different, parents, i found, have a very good sense. If you are feeling like your child does need that assistance from you, then guess what? You're right. They probably do. And you're not going to abandon a disabled child just because other people might think that you're enabling them or just because the school principal might think that you are somehow coddling your child and it's time for them to sink or swim. There's not going to be that magic threshold that your child is going to cross and all of a sudden become normal and responsible and you can simply go back to doing what typical parents are going to do. This is a gradual developmental process. They get better gradually with age. But compared to other children of any age, they are always going to require a little more structure, a little more support, a little more of this scaffolding, as I call it, than other people. So please keep that 30% rule in mind. And remember, if you sense that your child needs your assistance and you're providing it, they probably do, and you're not enabling them. That's really great advice. I think the, the accusation of enabling is something that lots of ADHD parents have to cope with, and it's a difficult one. Um, the, uh, in terms of behavior modification techniques, um, a couple of parents have asked what your advice is on the kinds of strategies that would work with ADHD kids. An example of one that doesn't seem to be working for a number of, of the writers in is consequences. So several yes. of them mentioned they have children who have impulsive, inappropriate, wearing out, um, inappropriate behavior with their peers or at school, and they're constantly being put in timeouts or being given sure. this consequence or that consequence which seems to have absolutely no impact in terms, in terms of yeah, changing I know. behavior. Um, I know. I've heard that, uh, that concern many times. I want to come back and repeat something, however, that um, if your child has at least moderate ADHD or more severe ADHD, then psychological treatments and behavior management alone is probably not going to suffice. You're probably okay. going to have to combine that with medication to get maximum benefit. Sometimes parents avoid the medication hoping that just the psychological or the behavioral interventions will be sufficient. Uh, and we try them, and they're not sufficient, and then you're going to have to add the medication in order to make those behavioral interventions become more effective. There's a reason why over 70% of ADHD children are taking medication along with doing all of these other programs we've mentioned, and that's because the medication is the most effective thing we have. So let's make sure that we keep that on the table here. But that said, and assuming that a child may or may not be on medication, what can we do about that? I think the first thing to understand is that ADHD children have problems with internal motivation, internal consequences. We all use internal motivation when we're asked to get things done when there are no consequences around us. And so we have to come up with our own consequences. We have to think about the goal and make it more important to ourselves and motivate ourselves to get things done. And ADHD children can't do that. They can't work for extended periods of time when there are no consequences in the environment that are rewarding them 
for the work that they're doing. So a lot of times children get into trouble with this impulsive and disruptive behavior because people are expecting them to work for prolonged periods of time without there being any monitoring and any consequences for doing so. So parents need to understand that an ADHD child needs much more frequent consequences, much more frequent feedback, and much more salient consequences than other children. So if you think that a little praise or a pat on the head or a little squeeze of affection on their shoulder is enough to do it, you're wrong. These children require much heavier consequences to motivate them to do what other children will do on their own or would do for simple praise or acknowledgement. So you're going to have to drag out the big guns. You're going to have to get out the rewards, the privileges, uh, the point systems, the token systems, and so on. And even you know things like special toys or extra money in their allowance. But you're going to have to set up a schedule of very frequent feedback to this child that involves these kinds of points and tokens and rewards much more often than another child is going to need. And that is because your child doesn't have that internal fuel tank that other kids have, that internal motivation. They are dependent on those external consequences. Make them more frequent and the child will work for you. But expect your child to sustain their behavior for 20, 30, 40 minutes without there being any consequences. And again, I come back to the point. You're the problem, not the child. You just don't understand the child's difficulties. So make sure that you are providing frequent feedback and rewards and approval, but also these tokens and points and more material rewards that your child is going to need to motivate themselves. Now, the second problem parents run into with these behavioral plans is that they wait too long to deliver the consequences. And teachers do this a lot. So a child starts to misbehave, we tell them not to. They continue to misbehave, we remind them not to do that. They keep misbehaving, and then we start to threaten them. But that's all it is, is hot air. It's a threat. Then they continue to misbehave. Finally, after 20 minutes of this kind of conflict, a parent or teacher decides, okay, that's it, I've had it. You're going to your room, you're going to timeout, you're losing your video games or your, you know, your PlayStation, you're not going to get to play these things. But that's too late. The time to respond to a child's misbehavior is within 10 to 15 seconds of the start of the misbehavior. If you're letting it go beyond that, again, you're part of the problem here, not the child. So if a child starts to misbehave, you need to be very quick. Understand that swift justice is what you're all about here. So if your child starts to behave well, you need to be providing frequent rewards to them. But also, if your child starts to misbehave, Whatever the consequence is going to be, whether it's going to be loss of electronic privileges or timeout, or you're going to take points away from them, or you're going to take a privilege away from them for later that day, you must do it quickly and not continue to natter, harangue, cajole, remind, argue, and then after 30 minutes when you're so ticked off you can't stand it anymore, then you finally choose to do something. If that's your approach to parenting, then you're the problem. You don't understand the nature of the disability here. So understand the disability and act quickly, and don't talk so much. One of the things that we teach parents in our parenting program is to act, don't yak. In other words, shut up and do what you said you're going to do. But if you talk, you lose. So talk less, touch more, act quickly, and respond to that child as soon as you can if they start to misbehave. And then you're going to find that you're going to start to get a more responsive child. Um, that, that's that's really fascinating. And, but I take it from what you're saying, Dr. Barkley, that you o over time um, you do you do expect children's behavior. You do see children's behavior changing for the better, whether that be passage of time or behavior modification or medication or whatever contributes to it. But there yes. should be ultimately some progress in terms of yes, there should be. And by the way, understand that most of that progress comes from maturation of the brain not from the things that you're trying to do. If, if you approach this as, I can train this out of my child, so I'm going to set up a token system for a couple of weeks. I'm going to use time out with my child for a couple of weeks, and then he'll be better, and I can pull back that scaffolding, and he won't need my support anymore, then you're wrong. I'm sorry, but you're wrong. I mean, that would be like saying, I'm going to treat a diabetic for two weeks, and then it's over. No, diabetes is a chronic condition, and it needs to be managed every day, and so does ADHD. But unlike diabetes, ADHD improves with age. So there is this maturation. 
So yes, as the child gets older, over the next few months and over the next year, you can begin to thin out some of the support and structure and extra assistance you're providing to them, but you can't pull it. You can never get rid of it. They will always need a little more of that external structure than some other child of their age. But can you thin the program a little and back off a little bit? Sure. And you're going to know when to do that. You're going to see sometimes that when you pull back, they're able to handle it. If they can't, then you're going to step back to what you were doing previously. And the child can show you whether they can handle that reduction in support and structure. Uh, but don't just assume that after a few weeks or two months that the game is over and you're all done and you can go back to being a typical parent again. I'm sorry, that's just not the way life is for an ADHD right. child. But they do improve with maturation, and you can boost that maturation a little bit with your, the programs that you provide, the training you do. And, of course, we now know from a number of studies that even medication, the longer you stay on it, the more quickly the brain develops. So we're actually seeing what are called neuroprotective effects from medication. Children who stay on their medication longer seem to have better brain development than the children who didn't get the medication. So that's an important that, point. That's the development of the neurotransmitters then? Or, uh, it's or? the development of the structure of the brain, we believe. Brain. And as a result of keeping the brain more stimulated with these medicines, the areas of the brain that are not developing as quickly may actually develop a little faster. Uh, again, it's not a promise of a cure. We're just right. talking about a little acceleration in development, not an elimination of the disorder. But one of the exciting developments in research in the last two years have been studies now, multiple studies, showing that the longer the children stayed on medication, the better was the brain development that they were um, tracking through their neuroimaging uh, studies here. So that's a very interesting finding. I, again, I don't promise parents that they're going to get that, but there mm -hmm. is some suggestion of that. The, well, what's being learned about the brain nowadays is just so fascinating, you know, the plasticity, well, none of which was really, I guess, uh, in the literature 10 years ago even. Um, quite right. Turning to the emotional side of things, um, there are a number of people who have written in who have very explosive children, sometimes um, just the sort of meltdowns. Um, for example, a child who seems to be doing fine, getting out the door, but then suddenly, you know, can't finish, find his shoes gym shoes or, or can't, something, and then just yeah. completely falls apart and yeah, is, has a meltdown there. No, yeah. uh, total meltdown. And similarly, in the evenings, many parents report that their child who seems to have held it together all day um, will just completely melt down um, okay. in the evening hours. Well, so two examples, three or four examples there on meltdown side. Yes, yeah, indeed. I certainly understand that. Having been raised in a family where ADHD was pretty uh, prolific, uh, first-hand testimony of these kinds of meltdowns. But um, I, there, are, there are three issues I want to talk about here in response to that. Uh, the first is there is emotional control problems that ADHD creates. There are emotional control problems that other disorders are causing uh, and that can go with ADHD. Over 80% of ADHD children have a second disorder. Over 50% of them have a third disorder. Some of those disorders are emotional disorders. And then the third issue that I uh, would want to speak about with them uh, is this idea that uh, these emotions uh, in, in this child are an index of this immaturity that I spoke about with ADHD, uh, and that they can be managed with medication. And sometimes what we see with medication is that the child is prone to these meltdowns after the medication has worn off late in the day, late in the evening. Uh, so let me just remind parents about that. And then lastly, I want parents to understand that uh, we as people have a very limited pool of energy, so to speak, for controlling ourselves. So there's this limited resource of self-control that we all have, and you can use it up, and you can use it up quickly. And after you've used it up, it takes a while to recover that self-control, that, that strength of will uh, that we have to be able to manage our own behavior, to resist our impulses, to control ourselves. So keep in mind that ADHD children have a smaller fuel tank. They have less self-control, less willpower, less strength of self-control than other children do, and they expend it rather quickly. So it's no surprise that at the end of the day, you may find that your child is much more prone to impulsive, 
emotional, dysregulated, and defiant behavior than they were. And that's simply because your child's self-control, this fuel tank for self-control, is empty. And just as with a car, we're going to have to do some things to refuel the tank. And I'll come back and give you some ideas about what you can do to refuel the self-control fuel tank. But let me deal with the other issues first. ADHD does convey a deficit in emotional control. It is a problem with self-control, and part of what you have to control is your emotions. So there is low-level self-control problems that ADHD children automatically have as part of their disorder, uh, and that's because they're impulsive. So in this case, the emotion that they have is rational. It makes sense. You would feel the way that they do, but you would expect them to manage it, to suppress it, to moderate it, and to not be so impulsive with their emotions. So. If somebody's done something to frustrate them, if you've taken something away or something's happened like a toy has broken uh, or they can't find something that's important to them, yes, you can expect them to react with frustration, impatience, anger, or tears rather quickly. Uh, you would feel the way they do. You would be frustrated, but you would have controlled that frustration better. So that's the kind of thing I want parents to understand goes with ADHD, the emotion they're having makes sense, it's reasonable, but they're not controlling it as well as other children. If that's what you're seeing, that's part of ADHD. Now, on the other hand, if it's more severe than that, then it might be part of a mood disorder, such as depression, bipolar disorder, or an anxiety disorder, depending upon the particular emotion we're talking about. But if it's explosive anger, if it's a child becoming very destructive and violent over trivial events, if it's a child who throws a temper tantrum and starts banging their head uh, and starts to become very aggressive uh, over almost nothing, then that may indicate that there is a more severe mood disorder there. That child needs to be evaluated for that, and that mood disorder may require separate treatment, such as separate medications to help gain control over that. So the dividing line between what emotions are ADHD and what emotions may be due to another disorder is, is the emotion reasonable? Would other people or other children have felt that way in that situation? If they would have, then that's the ADHD component. It's a reasonable emotion that the child just can't control as well as others. On the other hand, if the emotion is irrational, it makes no sense. Other people would never have reacted this much to this degree over something so trivial. Or if the child's emotions are so capricious, that is, they're changing so quickly, that it has nothing to do with the environment at all, uh, and you have no idea why the child feels the way that they do, that's a mood disorder. And that is going to require separate evaluation and separate treatment. So please make sure you understand the difference. Not all emotional upset can be written off to ADHD. It might be another disorder that needs additional treatment. Now, how can we refuel that fuel tank if that's part of the problem where the child has had to control themselves for, let's say, an hour or two hours, uh, either in school or because you've had company over or because you've been busy working at home doing something else and you've expected this child to behave themselves? At the end of that time, your child is going to need to refuel their fuel tank. One of the things that you can do to help a child build up their self-control fuel tank so that they can go on with better self-control is what I've already recommended earlier. Make sure that you are using lots of frequent positive feedback, rewards, immediate privileges for them, praise, approval. Those kinds of things can help refuel the tank. The second thing is make sure you're not asking them to work for too long. So we've developed what we call the 10 and 3 rule, 10 minutes of work, three-minute break. Then you work for 10, then you get three. If you're dealing with a very young child, for instance, a child who's under, say, five or six, then it becomes five and two. Five minutes of work, two-minute break. But 10 and three is a great rule of thumb for how long to expect a child to sustain their actions uh, at a task, at work, or just to show restraint uh, during a meeting, like a Cub Scout meeting, uh, and so on you need to follow that 10 and 3 rule. Make sure that during that break, they can be active, they can you know, do some exercise, do some jumping jacks, go outside for a walk, take a quick break, but do something active, 
uh, maybe get a beverage, get a drink, and so on, and then come back and do another five to ten minutes worth of work. So ten and three is a great rule to remember. Now, during that break, besides physical exercise, which is very good for them, I want you to make sure that you keep some uh, sugary drinks on hand. I know this sounds like it's the opposite of what you heard, but this actually helps. Uh, your self-control is based on the amount of blood sugar in the brain at any point in time. And if that blood sugar gets a little low, your child's self-control is going to get a little thin. So by sipping on a little lemonade or a little sports drink like Gatorade or Powerade or something like that, I'm not talking about gulping, you know, 32-ounce beverages. We're talking about sips here. But maintaining a level of blood sugar in the brain when work has to be done or when restraint has to be shown can be very helpful to these children. So when they take a break, make sure that they might be able to take a sip of some of these sugar-containing substances. I know you heard that sugar makes kids hyperactive. That is absolutely false. We disproved that 20 years ago. And what we're seeing now is that a little bit of blood sugar actually helps children to maintain their self-control. It actually helps adults, too. The other thing I want you to think about is making sure that your child engages in regular routine aerobic exercise at least three times and better yet, five times a week. So we're talking here about getting them involved in things like running or sports uh, or basketball, football. The sport doesn't matter, whether it's martial arts, whether it's playing soccer, whether it's just long distance running, uh, whether it's just working out in a gym, it doesn't matter. It's the physical activity. This needs to be done for 30 to 45 minutes at least three to five times a week. And that helps ADHD children to cope with their disability better. It also reduces their ADHD symptoms. And as I've just said, it helps them to refuel that self-control fuel tank. So, so uh, physical exercise is better for ADHD than it is for any other psychological disorder we know of. So take advantage of that and make sure that your kids get lots of physical exercise. Um, Dr. Barkley, to that point, a number of parents have written in to say that their kids have tremendously negative attitudes, so um, they don't want to try sports or hobbies. They um, reject family outings or things that they seem would seem otherwise to enjoy, and um, they're wondering if this sort of negativity, this attitude of um, this refusal to sort of jump into things is an ADHD um, issue. Or if well, it, your management issue there as well. Yeah. Well, it, it can be an issue because we know that uh, ADHD individuals are less patient, a little more irritable, a little quicker to anger or to get frustrated. Uh, and over time, if they experience that in a situation repeatedly, they're not going to want to do that anymore. And they're not going to want to do that with you anymore. So understand that some of this sort of irritability uh, is the result of that. Hmm. Now. Besides that, however, uh, let's also keep in mind is part of the resistance because of the way we behave in those situations, the way we behave toward them on family outings or when we sit down to help them with homework or when we go out to help them do chores in the yard or things like that. I mean, if we're constantly nattering and picking and looking for the things they're doing wrong and criticizing and disciplining them, and we've not taken as much time to keep up the positive side of those consequences, then it's no wonder that they're going to automatically react the next time around with that kind of refusal and irritability and bad attitude. I mean, who would want to go off with somebody who's acting like the worst supervisor you've ever had to deal with? So I ask parents to take a moment and do a little self-reflection here. Have we as parents contributed to that problem because of our nattering, our nagging and bitching and moaning? about what the kids are doing wrong. Because if that's the case, then we could be part of that problem. Uh, so I want to make sure that parents understand what role they might be playing in that. Now, that said, uh, I think it's also important that parents beef up the positive side of what could happen in a trip like that uh, or in an outing or during a session. So I ask parents to start out any new activity with the promise of a reward. If you follow these particular rules, if you decide that you're going to um, go into a, a shopping area or a store, then before you go into the store, very quickly review what the rules are and review what the reward is going to be in that situation. Uh, and the reason I ask parents to do that is set it up as a positive, as a win-win 
before you get into that situation with them. Because if you don't set it up as a win-win, no wonder they're upset. You're asking them to go into a situation they don't like, they don't enjoy, they're not going to earn anything, there's nothing in it for them other than that you want them to behave themselves. Uh, and then you drag them through a shopping mall on your own shopping trip, you know, searching for dresses or what have you, and you're upset that they don't want to go or that they, uh, they misbehave. So if you're going to ask them to do things that other children wouldn't enjoy doing either, then you better set up a little contract or a little promise of a reward and reward them throughout the trip and see if that can boost the problem. Finally, I want you to take a look and see whether or not there um, are situations with your child uh, there, where the child uh, might have enjoyed doing something a little different than what you're proposing to do so that you can still accomplish what you wanted to do uh, but blend in some of your child's preferred activities. You know, you may enjoy certain things or you may think that your child would enjoy them uh, and they could care less about them. So sometimes it helps to stop and take inventory of your child's own personal desires and wants and interests and weave those into the trip and not just automatically assume that your child is going to want to do what you would like them to do or what you think you would have liked to have done as a child. They're different than you are. They may have different interests. Uh, and try to weave in some of that. And the best way to, to do that is to find out what they like and talk to them and ask them is there something that they would like to do during that trip or during that situation uh, in addition to the things that you're going to need to get done. Uh, and then use their interests woven throughout the activity if possible. I understand it's not always possible. But see if that doesn't improve it as well. So uh, again, uh, Make sure that you're not contributing to the irritability and the problem by the way you're acting. Make sure that you've set up some positives before you even start the activity, even creating a little contract with your child about what they'll be able to earn that they enjoy doing by how well they behave in that situation. And then throughout the task, make sure that you provide approval and positive feedback for what they're doing. Uh, and then, as I said, make sure that you weave in some of the things that they're interested in doing. And you might find that that would help. Now, failing that, uh, again, we come back to uh, it may be a sign that your child, like some children, might need to be on medication as well. Um, one, one of the things that a number of parents mentioned who's specifically around this issue of children who don't want to take part in sports, don't, aren't interested in activities outside the home, is that their kids are very addicted to, to um, screen games or electronic games. And I guess there, there are a few questions around that that, yeah. I mean, in addition, maybe not the wrong word, but very interested in spending time on their, on their computer screens. Um, yeah. The question of whether that's damaging, um, or as someone else mentioned maybe kids need to tune out occasionally. I mean, how, how, what do you recommend to parents in terms of managing screen time? Well, it's a, it's a much more complicated uh, issue, and I'm glad that they're bringing it up because it really speaks to some of the cutting-edge research that's been done in the past year or two. First of all, we have discovered in the last two years that people with ADHD are much more prone to Internet addiction and to video game addiction and to, to basically using computers as a form of entertainment, whether it's Facebook or social networking or gaming with other people uh, on the Internet, like World of Warcraft or some of these team games that they can play. Uh, or just playing individual video games, people with ADHD appear to be three to five times more likely to fall prey to an internet dependency or gaming, uh, you know, video gaming addiction. So these parents are not wrong when they say that they see their child's propensity to opt into these activities much more than other children are likely to do, uh, to the point where it's detrimental to them because they're spending so much time doing it. So absolutely right. Parents need to be on guard for this possibility because they have a child that is very prone to seeking out the most immediate rewarding activities. And of course, that's these kinds of activities. Uh, and that leads to this kind of dependence or addiction. Uh, so yes, the parents are correct. That can happen. Uh, the first thing I ask parents to do is to make sure that you um, are limiting the amount of time that your child has access to these things. Computer games, uh, video games, social networking, uh, smartphones, uh, laptops, iPads, iPods, these are all privileges. And parents need to treat them as such and not as rights or entitlements. Uh, and so I want parents to understand they can be using these as contingent privileges for getting their children to do 
uh, work or their chores or their homework and so on. But if you allow your child to have carte blanche, open access any time of day to a smartphone or an iPad or a computer, it's just part of your household furniture these days, then that's part of your problem. These are privileges and they need to be controlled and limited. Uh, and your child needs to have a certain amount of time with them, and then they're taken away or they're put away or the power's shut down. But it needs to be time limited. It needs to be contingent, which means it needs to be earned, and it needs to be earned on the basis of getting the other things done that are much more important than the video gaming. But, uh, you know, sometimes we as parents have been too nice to our kids in providing them with open, uh, almost entitlements to things, including paying their monthly cell phone and privileges and buying them the latest iPad as soon as the edition is out and so on. Uh, and that's part of the problem. I mean, it's no longer a privilege to be earned. It's an entitlement that belongs to them. And then you try to take it back, and there's all kinds of screaming to be paid. But take it back you must, because these things can be used in a very time-limited way for rewarding your children for the things that they need to get done. And that's how it should be used. You don't let your child have open access to the refrigerator. You don't let them eat ice cream all day. You shouldn't be letting them on the social networking and video gaming devices throughout all of their free time. It needs to be quite limited. So take back control of these electronic privileges. Now, that said, parents also need to understand that, yes, children do need downtime. They do need recreational time. And as I pointed out, ADHD children need more of that, and they need it more often in small doses. I go back to the 10 and 3 rule I mentioned earlier. 10 minutes of work, maybe you get three minutes to check your email or look at your smartphone or look at the iPad, but then we're taking it away. Now we're going back to work again, and it's given out in small doses uh, rather than just being available any time the child wants open access to it. So make sure that you control the devices, use it, but do allow them to use it. Uh, from time to time uh, across the day. But they don't get to spend hours in their room doing World of Warcraft with five other people around the world that you have no idea who these people are. If you're doing that, then you're using electronics as a babysitter. You're using it so that you can get some free time and you can get away and get some other work done. Uh, but you're allowing your child access to something of, around which they could develop a dependency. And so you need to rein that in a little bit and understand you know, who's deriving the benefits here? I know that these things can be used uh, to help children quiet down and to serve as a babysitter when we need some quiet time with another child or with our spouse or partner, uh, but don't overdo that, allowing them such open access that now you're going to have trouble getting control over it again. I think the tough thing for parents is, I mean, I think it's just to speak up on behalf of our, our parents that we hear from so much. Um, not the younger ages where you can certainly make rules, but when kids get to high school and college where um, everything takes place online, your assignments, the, right. you know, the textbook has an online mind. It's very difficult unless you sit there with them to, mo to, to make sure that they're not actually flipping over to Facebook for an hour to a night or what. You know, take right. away the computer access is tough when you have a... Um, it does require monitoring, but that's yeah. part of you know, raising children and teenagers is the, right. the spot checking. So I tell parents... Uh, that you need to be doing random, unannounced spot checks. There are other times where you need to pick up the electronic device, go, uh, you know, open up the search program like Google, and look at the history. Where have they mm -hmm. been? What are they doing? Uh, pick up the smartphone. Take a look in the trash bin uh, of their email. Um, but uh, parents have a right to be supervising these electronic devices and to spot check them and to go in and do periodic audits uh, when the child isn't around uh, just to see what has been happening. Uh, and your child does not have an exclusive right to privacy. They are not an adult. Uh, they do not uh, get this sort of entitlement to privacy that you and I would get. Uh, and therefore, you as a parent need to know what they're using these devices for. So yes, by all means, you need to be spot checking and doing these audits uh, and controlling it. But yes, they're going to need access to these devices for getting their work done and their schoolwork and their research and you know, their social Facebook time. But parents need to manage that time. Not exclude it, but manage it. Okay. Um, on this question of, of, of I guess, te older te kids, teens, whatever, two questions have come up. Um, a number of people have asked about the impact of puberty on ADHD symptoms, both in parents of boys who, who wonder if they're, 
increased aggression or uh, distractibility related to puberty and parents of girls who see sort of PMS, you know, exacerbating, uh, maybe estrogen shortfalls exacerbating ADHD symptoms, and they're wondering if if that's something that's confirmed, in your opinion, by the literature of what you've seen. Sure. Um, well, it, it's uh, actually it's an area about which we have very, very little research, and yet it is an area where we know we need to start doing more research because I think the parents are right. First of all, I want to start with the girls because I think we at least have more clinical evidence, even if we don't have controlled studies. Uh, that uh, puberty does alter emotion regulation in these girls. And so remember, your child already has a problem with emotional regulation, and now you're putting them in a period of their life where they're going to be experiencing the typical sort of PMS symptoms that any girl might experience with their monthly cycle. And if that's the case, <clears throat> they're going to have a harder time of it. Uh, and we've even had uh, teenagers to the point where they've had to be put on certain mood stabilizers or antidepressants for three to five days during mm -hmm. that time of the month in order to help get more control over their emotional uh, outbursts and dysregulation uh, as a result of their PMS. So, yes, parents are correct, and if it's serious enough, then consult with your physician, a psychiatrist, for instance, and see if you can add, just for a few days around that time of each cycle, um, an additional uh, mood managing medication to help them get more control over their emotions. Now, the second thing that puberty brings with it, particularly in males, uh, is this desire for um, showing off and trying to establish themselves in the power hierarchy that males set up. You know, uh, women don't necessarily engage in this as much as men, but boys are very much about power and hierarchy and where you fall in this power assertion um, hierarchy of other kids. And so they tend to show off, take risks, try to prove themselves to other people, you know, about who's stronger, who's more willing to do things on a dare, who's more willing to take chances, you know, who's got the guts and the courage to do these sorts of things that usually in hindsight are quite foolish. But that's a natural part of being an adolescent male uh, and also of males testing each other to see, uh, you know, just how strong they are, how much risk-taking they're willing to take. Uh, than other males are likely to do. And because your kids are so impulsive, when they encounter this kind of, you know, testing by other males or this kind of showing off in order to position themselves in this hierarchy, uh, they're more likely to do these foolish things than other males are likely to do. Uh, and as a result, they're going to get in trouble or they're going to get hurt or suffer an accidental injury because of this kind of risk-taking. So now that you know that going into it, you're going to have to you know, I think periodically supervise your teenage boys more often than you would like. Know who they're hanging around with. Pay attention to the kinds of things that you overhear them talking about with other boys uh, when they're hanging out at your house or when you take them out on group activity occasions. You know, in other words, heads up, pay attention, listen for what they're doing, and make sure that you're monitoring some of this activity because they are much more risk-taking than other kids are likely to be. Now, the question of puberty that applies to both sexes is, of course, emerging sexuality. And we know that ADHD, or teens and adults, rather, uh, engage in risky sex. So as they become sexually active, because of their poor impulse control, they are more likely to be engaging in sexual activity that other teenagers would have refrained from doing uh, or doing to that extent. Uh, and so, uh, we ask parents to talk more about the child's emerging sexuality, make sure your child has appropriate sex education, consider whether or not it's time to have a discussion about contraception. Uh, you also want to monitor your teen's dating activity, maybe allow them only to go out on group dates where there are groups of people, not individual dates, uh, where there's less supervision and a greater likelihood of sexual activity taking place but you better monitor them. 40% of ADHD children have a baby by 19 years of age, and it's nearly 70% of the girls that we followed in my follow-up study. So early sex and early childbearing are mm. part of the risk that puberty brings with it when an ADHD child moves up through puberty into being an ADHD adolescent, and parents need to be ready for that and monitoring that more and take precautionary steps if necessary to head off some of these future risks that are there. 
I think that this speaks to a concern that a number of parents have posted since here during the webinar, since hearing your 30% rule, sort of saying, well, well, if my child's 30% younger than his chronological chronological age, what happens when he goes to college? He or she goes to college. Well, yeah. that's the problem. They Pretty fail, which is concern. why yeah. the vast majority of kids with ADHD who are not being dealt with properly uh, often fail to get through even the first semester of college. Uh, so that 30% rule applies to adolescents as well as it does to children. Uh, for instance, I mentioned driving. Let's take, let's take driving. Should your child be allowed independent driving privileges at 16? And the answer is flat out no. They're the worst drivers on the highway. They're the highest risk. I can't tell you how many patients we have that had either killed someone, killed themselves, or gotten into very severe action, accidents as a result of their impulsive, distractible, risk-taking right. behavior. I think that we'll, we will end the webinar now. I'm going to thank him and thank all of you for attending. Um, the transcript, the audio will be on the website. And um, I think it was a really terrific webinar. And I thank Dr. Barkley. Thank you all. For more Attitude podcasts and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com.